Great. So I'd like to invite uh, all the panelists and, and Michelle, you too, to, yep. to come back and take a seat up at the front. <coughs> now, ordinarily, I would offer each of the panelists an opportunity to respond uh, to Michelle's remarks, but we're actually going to have 24 hours to respond uh, to Michelle's <laughs> remarks. And many of you in the room here, um, this is your opportunity to, to interact with, uh, with this material and, and with these researchers. So I'd actually like to, assuming that's all right with folks on the panel, uh, throw it immediately to, to Q&A so that people in the room have an opportunity to share their perspectives and, uh, and ask any questions of the panelists that, uh, uh, that they'd like. So please, uh, there's a mic actually up at the front. So if you wouldn't mind making your way to the mic, then everybody yeah. can hear. Perhaps just briefly identify, uh, briefly identify yourself before your question or comment. Hello, uh, my name is Omer. I'm a master's student at Carleton University. Uh, my question is about the um, initiatives, any kind of projects that are going around the application of artificial intelligence in risk management and risk analysis process. Thank you. Uh, that's a great question and certainly one that I think, one, one thing I would just note is that for this initial um, phase of at risk, we've actually tried to keep um, the number of cases to a relatively low, sort of a relatively small number, but we will be expanding that out uh, in the future as we move to next phases in the project. But th having said that, I would welcome uh, any comments from folks on the panel uh, to that particular topic. As, um, again, pulling on my public health side, when you look at AI, it can have impacts on both sides of uh, public health. One is the impact on the actual technology you use in public health. And the other side is what is happening to the society so that you have to, uh, you, you better understand what you need to address from a public health perspective. It's within the second category that we're much more concerned about uh, the potential impacts on social structures, uh, access to employment, um, potential uh, employment, um, almost anything else. So as a result, we began, we've actually just begun a, a project that will allow us to do a bit of risk management around what are, what are the key changes that might be coming out as a result of the application of AI. And I take it actually beyond simple AI because artificial <coughs> intelligence has a fairly clear definition and construct. But when you start looking at robotics, where you go in and change the level of employment people might have on site, or you look at the impacts of genomics as uh, a disruptive technology, or of nanotechnology in terms of disruptive technologies, you start encompassing the changes in society that will impact how we live in the future. So those are stu uh, discussions that are really just nicely getting underway as we're seeing the, the, the potential impacts of the technologies come into place. And, and I would agree, even though it's not one of our uh, case studies, uh, the, the framework and the tools that have been developed could easily be applied to that circumstance, but you would have to also break down what it is that you mean. Are you talking about self-driving cars, for example, or are you talking about robotics and on the different types of, of risks that exist? And there are social risks um, as well as you know the Armageddon of robot enslavement of humans. You know, Jennifer. <laughs> well. I know that there are several scholars working on that, and there's um, you might want to check out books. I think they're called like robot robot ethics or robo ethics, um, and it, I I think it was Monica or somebody just sent me a policy statement from the U.S. that you know the technology coming from the White House um, that the artificial intelligence and robotics and that shouldn't be um, stifled by. Uh, 
concerns of society or something to that effect. So <coughs> in, in this administration, I mean, that was the tone of the comment. That's not a verbatim, but um, coming out of a, a White House um, policy um, director there um, in the Office of Science and Technology Policy. So I, I don't have much hope on the US side that it's going to be taken seriously at the policy level. Um, however, there have been scholars that have been working on this for decades. And if you're interested in some names, I can give you them after um, the event, but um, lots of good books on it too, yeah. societal implication. And I would just add maybe a, a couple of things because we've done some work more broadly at the Institute that I'd be happy to discuss with you around these issues. And if I understand your question correctly, that there, there's not only thinking about risk governance and risk management for AI applications, so use Dwayne's example of, of self-driving vehicles, but there's also the utilization of AI as a risk management tool itself, which there you're getting into thinking about what are the values embedded in algorithms as a, for instance, and there certainly are people in our network at the Institute who are really quite uh, alive to, to those sorts of questions. And I could easily see subsequent stages of this project getting into exactly those issues because I think they are going to be coming at us fast and furious uh, in the next number of years. So happy to, to connect with you offline on that. Great. Next uh, question. Could you provide um, examples when public engagement based on values actually led to poor decisions, bad decisions in public policy and in the environment. We often think of vaccination, but there are many other case scenarios, just so that we can see that it's great to have public engagement, but sometimes that doesn't lead necessarily to a better decision. Thank you. struggling to think of an example because there's so few decisions that actually, in my domain of genetically engineered organisms that have actually incorporated public values. There have been public engagement events, but they haven't been tied to decision making. So I'm sorry, I'm, I'm at a loss, but we should know those examples. That would be very instructive to know. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah, it's tough because are you talking about what was a, a failed public engagement process? So I think of the debate about uh, water fluoridization, water fluoridization in, in Calgary, and they had a series of referendums on whether to get rid of it, and each referendum failed. So a new city council just said, well, we'll get rid of it. And one of the councillors said, we don't need hearings. I've, I've seen some websites, and that's enough for me. So it has had an impact on public health. Uh, the dentists are greatly in favor of this because the amount of cases has increased since they got rid of water fluoridation. Uh, but it wasn't a very good public engagement process. Actually, I just thought of one. There was a public engagement process in Florida for the genetically engineered mosquito I talked about here. Now, again, I think whether it failed is a normative judgment, but um, they did a lot of on-the-ground engagement. The company did, the state of Florida did with the local communities, and they actually put it, the Mosquito Control Board in Florida put it to a vote um, on the November 2016 elections with that ballot. Um, and the county actually voted yes, we should deploy the mosquito. This was after it had been approved by FDA. But the town in which that they were going to deploy it, Key Haven, in the Key West, Florida, voted against it. And so therefore, they did not deploy the mosquito. Um, because the Mosquito Control Board was going to follow the decision of the referendum. Now, one could argue that was a bad outcome if you think that this is a good product that should have been deployed for public health reasons of decreasing dengue and Zika transmission. I don't know. See, I think, I think again, you know, failure is somewhat of a judgment as well. So, well, and I think it also just kind of uh, boils down to. Are you looking at good or bad outcomes on the basis of if the public engagement 
change the decision of whatever the decision was or if it was actually having opportunities for a lot of different things to be discussed and then still having you know arriving at a decision that might have been balancing all of the different perspectives in a way that made the best kind of trade-offs in terms of potential harms and benefits because a public engagement process doesn't necessarily have to lead where the public wins in whatever it is that the public might want but rather that there is actually, there are meaningful and genuine opportunities for discussion and dialogue, and th that those don't occur just after decisions have been made, and then it goes into kind of more tokenistic consultative processes of, I've already made a decision, so now let's just talk about it. Yes. Yeah. My name is Peter McKinnon. I'm associated here with engineering and business school. And in fact, one of my principal interests is disruptive technologies and disruptive business models. AI is at the top of that list. I'd be interest, willing to talk about that privately if anyone's interested. I don't have a question, I have a comment. I came here with the in, in, in fascination that it ended with a question mark, the, the, type, the topic of this, this meeting. And I'd like to suggest a model, perhaps. When people are building things of any sort, you generally seek requirements. And from requirements, you design things and you create things and then you test them. Well, perhaps my model here is the requirements are the values in a public policy sense. You assess what are people's values, that's their requirements. You then seek to satisfy those requirements by building something and then seeking its risks. In the, so it's a two-step process where perhaps the most important part from the public point of view is assessing their values. And the technical expertise and then maybe broader social consultation could handle the risks. That's my comment. I'm interested in yours. Thoughts back uh, from panelists? I think it's an excellent comment and I think that there is a lot of um, interest in public policy schools and design thinking because designers take into account their clients and so if you think of emerging technologies in the same way I think that's a really con congruent with what you you um, said and there I should mention there are people in the social science world but it doesn't again get translated into practical policy you know who have uh, suggested various mechanisms one is called real-time technology assessment where developers of technology would consult with publics as they're designing the technology um, and there are other models out there but none of these are really being seriously deployed um, at least in the US context and, and from my understanding of the Canadian GMOs context either. so. But it, I, I, I enjoyed your comments, thank you. Yeah, I'd like to thank you for your comments. And I think it speaks a bit to the notion of what's chicken and what's the egg in this piece. And is it the values driving the, the development or, or are humans intrinsically into development and change and the values follow along afterwards? And what you're proposing is disruptive in itself because you're reversing that decision. Mm -hmm. um, be an interesting case study. Yep. Other comments? Okay, next question. Hi, my name is Andrea. I'm an undergrad student here at UOttawa. Um, my question is about education and educating the public about these different technologies because you form values based on what you know. So if the public, the public isn't um, educated around the, the wide breadth of knowledge that we have, um, how could they form an informed decision? And is, is it our place to educate the public in that sense? And just quickly as a kind of as a uh, clarification on that, do you mean education with respect to a particular, let's say, you know, nuclear waste uh, site selection mm -hmm. or education in the broader sense, the educational system prior, sort of where, where are you I think I'll, I'll, limit, I'll limit it to just the current topics okay. uh, on the board. Okay, okay great. Comments? Well, this is uh, actually one of the, the embedded values of the, the Nuclear Waste Management Organization is to have an informed consent, which requires education. The question is, who gets that education? And right now, their only focus is on the actual site, not the rest of the public as, as a whole. And then there are questions about who is educating, what knowledge is being put forward, which knowledge is not being put forward. It's, it's not a simple answer. 
think part of it boils down to if you're going to treat it like an information deficit problem uh, around a lot of the contentious issues as opposed to recognizing that some, sometimes there are an inherent um, contradictions. So if we look at the case of vaccine hesitancy, for example, often it is the, the, the you know, evidence has demonstrated that is the the, the, the smart thing to do, there's, you know, a long history of evidence to back and support that, and yet we've also had well over 40 years, 50 years of kind of a very strong neoliberal kind of perspective where in terms of devolution of responsibilities, people have received the message over and over again, we are responsible for our health, we are responsible to look after ourselves, we need to eat right, exercise, not smoke, do all these things. So when we have this constant uh, communication around we have to look after ourselves we have to accept responsibility we have to look at and make informed choices then it becomes problematic when members of the public choose to exercise that same kind of individual choice and decision making and decide to come up with a decision that runs contrary to what the community protection message might be. So there's often some of these inherent kinds of contradictions and how people are approaching things aren't necessarily fatally flawed even if you may not agree with how they're getting there. So, My view on this is a bit practical. I've participated in public engagement events with science museums and cafes and bars um, in both Minnesota and North Carolina. And um, typically, I, I agree with you that there's a baseline level of knowledge that is needed to make those events meaningful. Um, but I also have found that it doesn't require much. You know, a few slides. So I've been the person, the expert, I hate that term, but you know, to tell them a little bit about gene editing or nanotechnology, and then we deliberate about a particular issue. And I find that people with just a little bit of background knowledge can really ask these very insightful questions. And I also think that there's um, too much fear of the fear of the public. They call it phobia phobia in the literature. Scientists being afraid of the public being afraid. So there you go. Phobia phobia. They've called it symbiophobia nanophobia phobia and when I find when you deliberate with regular people who aren't entrenched in a particular interest group it's really not the case they have pretty informed reasoned and and, and their reasons may be based on different values but but they're um, they're able to communicate the pros and cons, they're not entrenched. However, some of the um, psychological and, and um, risk perception theory would say that people take in information that only fits their values. But I think when it's such a new topic, sometimes they haven't, are, you know, they haven't really formed that yet. I'm not, but there's contradictory evidence in the literature. But anyway, I'm optimistic because I've seen it happen, so. Frank, Actually, I just want to you know, uh, comment. I think you're, you're quite right, the issue is it public education, and the question is where and how are people getting their information? Previously, it was a rather controlled process where people obtained information, whether it be from the news, from their own readings, from other pieces, but now with the uh, advent uh, of web-based technologies and 24-hour news cycles, they aren't getting the information that they used to so that they can make an informed decision. Uh, and when you provide the reason scientific information in a public consultation, for example, uh, you will often be contradicted by those who have accepted in their belief and value systems what they've heard on, uh, through the web or through their neighbor or through the latest 30-second uh, soundbite on the news cycle. So there's your challenge. We have just enough time for the two more questions we've got, so please. I'm Bill Jeffrey. I'm with the Center for Health Science and Law. <clears throat> I, um, I expected there to be more discussion of quantification of risks here. And I, I came a little bit late, so maybe the first couple of presentations we're talking about it less abstractly. Um, I, I think a lot of um, misconceptions and prejudices fester in society because people don't have a good sense of you know, the likelihood of dying from X, Y, or Z, you know, and there's information out there, the Global Burden of Disease Project at uh, University of Washington's um, Institute for Health Metrics and Evaluation has been very valuable to our work. I mean, they've got all kinds of uh, risk information there about food and alcohol and tobacco. Um, and 
I, I just saw, but I haven't seen a lot of uptake. I mean, it seems like sometimes we're the only ones that's citing it. And I'm just curious uh, if you, any of the panelists have any thoughts on why quantifi quantified risk assessments aren't, be cited, aren't cited more often in these kinds of discussions. So. Um, I presented some, some, something on, along those lines, but um, quantification doesn't really matter because of some of these other factors associated with the technology. Like you can tell somebody from a risk risk comparison, you can tell somebody, you know, well, driving your car is less safe than, than um, eating a uh, pesticide in a food. But they can't control the pesticide in the food. They can control the car. So controllability and familiarity are two big factors in how people perceive risk. So sometimes the quantification, even if you have a really good estimate, um, isn't going to matter because of some of these other factors that are both cultural in the worldview as well as the um, associated with the technology itself. Now, you might say, is that irrational? Well, I don't think so. I think it's just a different way of perceiving things. If I can't control something, I'm generally more afraid of it too. And I'm a fairly rational person, not all the time. So, so I think some of these factors really do matter and that maybe even they should matter. Um, the second thing is the quantification of risk I've seen in my area of genetically modified organisms doesn't really exist. If you read these assessments, I mean, it does to some degree, but if you read the assessments, it's like, you know, low likely, it's, it's, it's mainly qualitative statements and there aren't these big, you know, models of, of risk that perpetuate uncertainty, or not perpetuate, but quantify. I've done uncertainty modeling in risk assessment. They're either point estimates, which are problematic, or they're um, qualifications, which are also hard to interpret, like highly likely reasonable uncertainty, unreasonable uncertainty, um, high uncertainty. So, so I, I have faith in good quantitative risk assessment if it's done well. I have not seen it done really well for GMOs because there's just a lack of information. I mean, there's a lack of studies that quantify it, except maybe direct toxicity testing in the lab. But That, that one quick example, um, the, according to this Global Burden of Disease uh, Project, I don't think there have been any deaths attributed to genetically modified foods in Canada, but say 9,000 to too much sodium. And so, so my point is, a lot of people are going through their lives dreading dying from consuming a genetically modified food um, and not caring about how much salt they're eating and in all likelihood they'll get heart disease. I can generally it. control the amount of salt I take in. Well, I can't really control whether genetically modified food is in my stuff in Canada or the US because it's not labeled. I mean, I can buy non-GMO. Now, I do I think yeah. GMO foods are unsafe? Not necessarily. But I also hear um, advocates on the public health and environmental side say we're not doing a lot of post-market monitoring. Mm -hmm. We're not doing epidemiological studies. We don't do whole food testing a lot of the times and these epigenetics. So there's uncertainty that you can argue that maybe we're just not looking for the effects. Um, so I hear them. I'm not worried about them. I eat them, my kids eat them, but, but I do hear their concerns. And because they can't control it necessarily, I think it makes them more afraid of it. In addition to conceptions of nature and what is natural, I think that plays a big part of it too. But anyway, we could talk yeah, more about yeah. this, but um, yeah, not, my, my bottom line is not good quantitative risk assessments for genetically modified food, ecological or, or human health hazards. Even good quantification yeah. is simply ignored. It, yeah, you know, exactly. uh, in the classic example I'll give <clears throat> from my own experiences, we had a uh, exchange student uh, who was killed in a uh, bar fight in Mexico City about a decade ago, and there was demands to shut down the entire exchange program, and it was one death out of 15,000 over the course of, of you know, 20 years, and the line was yes, but what if it was your daughter? Yeah. Right, and so exactly. quantification of risk is very useful, but in many cases it, it's irrelevant. It doesn't matter. Yeah. I'm, I'm conscious of time here, so what I'd like to suggest is that we give some space for the last uh, question. There'll be an opportunity to follow up with panelists uh, afterwards, so please. Uh, according to Arnstein's ladder, engagement of values and integration of values would require a very fulsome two-way communication with the, with, with the public. Um, I see inside this project at risk, you're looking at breast cancer nanotechnology, nuclear waste setting, GMO foods, or genetically modification of organisms. My question to the panel is, is there any thought of integrating 
the different case studies for the similarities of the values, sort of like what's common amongst them. And I say that because values change over time. If you, and the example I'll use is smoking. Back in the 50s and 60s, you would go everywhere, movies, TVs, media, everybody smoked. It wasn't perceived to be a big health risk. And today, the exact opposite. Same thing for nuclear power. I mean, it's changed incredibly over time, perception of the, the safety of nuclear power. So I'm just going to throw that out there and, and ask about the integration yeah. of, of the values within the at-risk project. Yeah. Thank you. Well, maybe I'll, yeah, maybe I'll <laughs> take that one. Uh, so I think that the, the, the quick answer is yes. Um, you know, and, and uh, not that, that we would have imposed on this audience the conceptual framework for the at-risk project. That's a good deal of what we're going to be talking about tomorrow. But in fact, that's, that's precisely where we're trying to go with this, is to identify, you know, A, an analytical framework that will enable us to better compare the cases, not only in terms of their similarities, also in terms of their differences. And the second year of the project on the values uh, front actually is going to be moving into some quantitative survey work, which hopefully will enable us to, to be moving forward and, and explore exactly some of the questions that uh, that you're raising um, one thing I would just note in 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 closing this though is this it's a large team these are um, in many instances and we haven't talked about fracking that's one of the cases or newborn blood screening or um, uh, you know exemption policies for vaccinations you know there are a variety of other cases that we're uh, that we're working on as well a as a team and I have to give really full credit to every single team member who, is, who have in many instances, instances come from extremely different, um, in some instances, sort of their, their um, empirical knowledge, in other instances, their disciplinary training. Um, you know, it's taken some time, and it's still taking time to get to a common language and, and even a common sort of set of objectives around what is it that ultimately we're looking for with, uh, with this project and ultimately that we're working towards with the project. Um, but that's precisely what a partnership development grant is about is giving you that time and space to come together as a team, just as we're doing over the last uh, couple of years, uh, to, get to, to get to being able to address the questions that, uh, the question that you've raised. Uh, so with that, what I'd like to ask everybody to do is join me in thanking uh, the panel and uh, invite you all to spend a little bit of time. We've got a reception at the back here and uh, we'd welcome the mingling afterwards. So thank you. Thank you.